Um, I don't know if you've uh, heard about the entrepreneur who died. He, his nurse and his wife, and uh, I think it was a daughter and a couple of, of sons were around his, ba his bed. And uh, in his last breath, he asked for a, a witness and um, two witnesses, actually, to be present in a camcorder. Uh, to record his last wishes, and when he began to speak, he said to my son Bernie, I want you to take the ocean reef houses, and, and uh, to my daughter Sybil, I want you to take, honey, I want you to take the apartments between mile, uh, the mile markers 100 and uh, whatever, and to my son Jamie, he said, I want you to take uh, the offices in, in the Marathon County or Government Center. And then to my dear wife, Sarah, he said, Honey, would you take all of the residential buildings on, on the Bay Side? And well, the nurse and the witnesses were just kind of blown away and they didn't realize this man had such extensive uh, holdings. And uh, as he slipped away, the nurse said, uh, Mrs. Jones, your husband must have been a very hard working man to have accumulated all this property. With, to which the wife replied, he had a paper out. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story because my mother delivered papers for many, many years. I'm the oldest of six, and, uh, and uh, seven days a week uh, she was out in the middle of the night. Uh, and so many experiences, let me tell you, that... Um, uh, that she had, but uh, today she, well, this, this year she will turn 97. I don't know if that's the secret of longevity, hard work, uh, but it so much reminded me of, um, that's a little bit of my history. I want to share the history with you of a uh, favorite story in scripture that I have. This is a man by the name of Cornelius, and if you have the scripture with you, I had to borrow this because my iPad did some weird things, and so... Uh, uh, it looks like this Bible's been used. I was going to say, you know, I've really been through this Bible quite a bit, but this is actually Pastor Bob's scripture. <laughs> so if you have Acts, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Acts chapter 10 this morning. And we're just going to share this morning from story form from uh, the, uh, the amazing story of, uh, of Cornelius. And I'm going to begin reading uh, with, uh, let's see, begin reading at verse 1, and uh, I'm going to read through uh, verse 8, I think. You know, I think I'm going to, would you, would you be so kind as to stand again? <laughs> Can I ask you to do that kind of up and down, just in honor of God's word, and then we're going to pray, and, and we're going to just talk about this man, Cornelius. Verse 1, it says, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family uh, were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those who in need and uh, prayed to God regularly. Interestingly, verse 3, one day, at about 3 in the afternoon, he had a vision he distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back an, a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, interesting, whose house is by the sea. Verse 7, when the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that uh, today you speak to us through your word. And I believe with all my heart that this is a message for the 21st century church. This is a message for... Uh, capital City Church. And so bless, uh, we pray, may our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears be open to your word this morning. And everybody said amen. 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 You may be seated again. Um, I, love this, uh, I love this man Cornelius, a very interesting guy. And uh, I think it's important that we understand who exactly he was. First of all, uh, I guess you could call him uh, a... Uh, uh, a pre-Christian. He was not really a follower of Jesus. And so let me tell you who he was. Cornelius was a Roman. He was a, 
a Gentile, he was a soldier, uh, I'm guessing perhaps a husband, perhaps not a husband, but he had children, and so he was a follower, or, but he was, a, he was a, uh, a father, rather, but he was not a follower of Jesus. Uh, in fact, there's no hint in the scripture whatsoever that would tell us that he even had heard of Jesus of Nazareth. And so what I want to call Cornelius this morning is a pre-Christian. A pre-Christian. I wonder, perhaps there are there is uh, a pre-Christian among us here this morning, and you're just sort of, um, you know, examining what Christianity is all about. We're delighted that you're here, and and this might be a message that you would that you would uh, resonate with. Well, you may call Captain Cornelius, uh, the centurion. Uh, a captain because that's pretty much what a centurion was. The Roman army was divided into legions. There were 6,000 soldiers in every legion. In every legion there were 10 cohorts. Uh, every cohort had 600 soldiers. Cohorts had six centuries and a century had a hundred soldiers in each. And the officer in charge of a century was called a what? Centurion, yes, and uh, was equivalent to a captain in most modern-day armies. While centurions were very important in the Roman army, they were trained and experienced. Uh, they were very wise men. Uh, they had great strength and courage, and it was not a particularly easy job. And I'm going to say especially for Cornelius. Centurions were uh, uh, these amazing, busy, uh, hardworking individuals. Um, soldiers would typically sign up for a 20-year career at the age of 17, would be discharged at the age of 37. Half of them died before they even reached their 20th year. And so you can imagine that this was a tough stint for any young man who uh, decided to become uh, a soldier in the Roman army. Well, the Italian regiment to which Captain Cornelius had been assigned was a particularly tough job. Caesarea was the capital city of Judea. It was a seaport uh, named after Julius Caesar. It was, it was built by King Herod the Great. And Palestine at that particular um, uh, juncture in history was, was a very dangerous place. There were rebels and terrorists uh, who were regularly mounting rebellions against the empire and solo attacks against uh, individual soldiers. I guess you could almost call them suicide bombers because that's pretty much what they were. Many of the Jews hated these Romans and especially the army and were willing to lose their lives to undermine their control of the land of Israel. Well, this bitterness between the Roman army and the Jewish people made Cornelius' uh, interest in their religion rather strange, I would say. Cornelius was fascinated by the Jewish faith, and we're told that he reverenced the God of the Bible, even, and, and prayed regularly, and he even gave money uh, to Jewish charities. Cornelius was not the only one who was drawn to God, but he had persuaded his family uh, to share his beliefs. It was very risky business on his part. Uh, uh, Jews didn't trust the Romans. The Romans didn't trust the Jews. And Cornelius is caught right in the middle where everyone could mistrust him. And it couldn't have been very good <laughs> for his career, uh, to say the least. Uh, you know, Roman soldiers uh, I, were, were, were actually required to take an oath of allegiance to the emperor as divine. And uh, it's one of the reasons why so many young Christian, uh, uh, Christians refused to serve in the Roman army at that time. And so for Cornelius, I just want you to get the picture here, for him to worship the Jewish God could really have been considered an act of treason. So how many are still with me this morning? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just kind of walking you through the, the background here. And uh, with that, I'm especially impressed with the way this man 
prayed. He talked to God before he was a Jew and before he was a Christian. And God apparently listened to him. What's that about? You know, sometimes people will say that God doesn't listen to the prayers of unbelievers. And I, you know, I just want you to hear me through on this. You know, if someone is, uh, I mean, this is Madison, Wisconsin, friends. So this is Madison, Wisconsin. If someone is a Jew or a Buddhist or a Hindu or some other religion and prays to God, I, I don't know. What do you think? It seems that God hears those prayers and and, you know, I'm going to say especially if they are the prayers of a genuine seeker, someone who is examining, who is, who is trying to figure out this Christianity thing, someone who is interested in knowing God. Now, a main difference, let me say, though, between the prayers of Christians and the prayers of non-Christians is that God has obligated himself to hear and to answer the prayers of believers who pray in the name of Jesus. And so when we Christians uh, pray to God, we're very careful to make clear that we're not coming on our own, but we come totally in the name of Jesus. Well, Cornelius couldn't pray that because he didn't yet know about Jesus. So here's what I believe. I believe that God was at work in the head and heart of Cornelius, I think perhaps for a very long time, that God was drawing him by the Holy Spirit, was teaching him through the Old Testament, the Torah, and God was preparing this man, Cornelius, to believe. He was in prep. I, I can tell you about, uh, you know, I pastored for 15 years in in Marshfield, Wisconsin, and my, the very first convert, very first, I think it was the first, well, the first day I was there, I, I don't even know if that was the lead pastor yet, and this young, uh, this young uh, ER doctor walked in with his, his young wife and baby daughter, and, and, um, and uh, he had never had a church experience, he was an atheist, and, and but his wife had been raised in the church and then had walked away from it and, and uh, since they had a little baby girl she says you know we need to get our butts back to church that's exactly what she said and so David and uh, Melissa started attending uh, Northridge Church of Marshfield where we pastored and I you know I didn't know what really was going on in their lives I did take a pizza out to them and got acquainted with them but a year later a whole so a solid year later uh, David walks into my office and he says, Pastor Galen, he says, for a year I've been, I've been uh, uh, studying Jehovah's Witnesses, I've been uh, studying uh, the Mormonism, I've been studying Christianity for a solid year, and I want you to know I can no longer refute Christianity. And he gave his life to Christ, and he has been a passionate believer. He's been on probably 25 missions trips, uh, medical missions trips since, and an elder in the church there. And, you know, sometimes people take a while to, to figure this thing out. And we want to give individuals who are pre-Christians that long arm and, and encourage them to keep, uh, keep uh, investigating, investigating. Well, Cornelius was being responsive to the draw of God. You know, again, God often prepares pre-Christians for faith. What does he do? He uses you. He uses friendship. Sometimes he uses broken relationships. I don't get it, but uh, there are times when someone goes through, has an accident or an illness, maybe a new job. Uh, but the point is sometimes uh, uh, totally surprising ways and means to prepare people for faith. He is in this preparation mode and Again, I wonder, I wonder if God isn't at this moment preparing some pre-Christians in your neighborhood for faith and desires to use you and to the desires to do, use Capital City uh, in reaching those individuals. I said all that to say this, never underestimate the ingenuity of God. It is so exciting. It is so exciting. You know, First Timothy... Whereas in chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, 
It says, God our Savior wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And so, yes, Captain Cornelius was a good man. He was a good guy. I mean, he was a good dude. He, he was working, uh, God was working hard in his mind and heart. And, and God, and Cornelius was being responsive to the initiative of the Holy Spirit. He prayed. He studied the Bible. He generously gave money to the poor. And yet, he was still an unbeliever. And so what did God do? He gave him a vision one day. God is like this great hound of heaven. He just doesn't give up. He doesn't give up. And, and uh, you know, there are a lot of dreams and visions that are reported in the Bible. And, and many are still being reported today. Perhaps God has given you a dream or a vision. And, and uh, you know, the Bible isn't completely clear on the difference between a dream and a vision. Some say that a vision is always this ecstatic uh, experience, kind of like being in a trance. I don't know. I, I, I'm really not an authority when it comes to <laughs> dreams or visions. Um, now, I do dream like everyone else. Uh, often I don't remember the dream. I had this amazing dream just a couple days ago. I don't think I thought of my grandmother for years and years and years and years and years. I lost, lost my sweet grandmother. I think when I was just a young man, and um, and it's like God, I don't know, it was, it was strange. It's like God opened uh, heaven for she and I to have this, to have hot, to have some fun together, and to, and uh, it, it's just one of those dreams that, you know, just kind of caught me, and, and uh, I don't know if it was, I don't know, I don't know, anyway, I am somewhat of a skeptic when it comes to you know, when people tell me that they've had a vision from God because I can't tell if, mm -hmm. if they really heard from God or they had put too much hot sauce on the burrito before going to bed the night before, I don't know. But I do believe that Cornelius' vision was from God. It says in the scripture one day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision, distinctly saw an angel of God who, said to, who came to him and said, Cornelius, uh, and Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord, he asked. And the angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor. Isn't that amazing? Your gifts, your prayers and gifts, gifts to the poor yes. have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now, he said, send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. I say study the scripture, friends. There, there's so much amazing stuff. This obviously was a clear vision, distinct, memorable sights and sounds. The angel called Cornelius by name. Cornelius called the angel Lord, which may mean that the angel was actually Jesus himself. Just saying the angel commended Cornelius for his prayers and his generosity, which I think is very interesting and important to note. And again, God seems to like it when unbelievers pray to him and will acknowledge the good that unbelievers do. And sometimes, you know, Christians talk as though People of other religions are all bad people doing evil. And obviously that's not the way that God views the prayers and good works of unbelievers. However, friends, listen, listen. Sincere prayers and good works, again, are not enough. You see, to eternally connect with God requires a repentance of your sin and faith in Jesus as Savior. Amen. And so the angel told Cornelius what to do next. He told him to send for Simon Peter, who was visiting a friend in the town of Joppa. Joppa was about 32 miles south of Caesarea, right on the Mediterranean coast. The angel gave, the, the angel even gave Peter's address in Joppa wasn't a street number, but very specifically, the house of Simon the Tanner, whose house was by the sea. 
which may seem like a minor detail, but that is loaded with significance and really showed the behind the scenes set up by God. You see, Peter was an Orthodox Jew, all right? And so, because he was an Orthodox Jew, he was forbidden to be around dead bodies of certain animals. Read Leviticus chapter 11. And here he is, he's staying in the home of a taxidermist, which most of his Orthodox friends, Jewish friends, would condemn. And I think it's, it, you know, just that little bit in the scripture indicates that Peter is not only broadening his thinking, but he is open to either breaking some old rules or living by some new freedoms. I don't know. I could really wax eloquent on that. I'll let Pastor Andrew uh, tackle that one. Uh, but um, anyway, Cornelius is told to send for Peter. And, and of course, he was used to taking orders from superior officers, immediately did what the angel ordered, told the vision to three men whom he totally trusted, one of his soldiers in his century, two of his servants who worked in his home. It was a very dangerous thing to do because, you know, he could have been reported for inappropriate behavior. And the soldier, uh, especially trusted, I believe, was also a pre-Christian who was seeking just like Cornelius. Um, how are we doing on time, Andrew? I, don't, I, I just don't want to go too long. Um, oh, I'll go a little longer. Anyway, <laughs> uh, you know, have you ever wondered, have you ever read this and wondered why um, the angel didn't directly tell Cornelius about Jesus? I mean, I, you know, that used to bother me a little bit. I think, though, there are a couple of reasons, and I think, first of all, and most importantly, that wasn't the angel's job. Jesus has commissioned Christians, like, right. like you and me, to tell pre-Christians how to believe in Jesus. Yeah. But there's another reason, I think. I think this is very important. God not only wanted to convert Cornelius, but he also had some... Uh, changes planned for Peter, as we will see. And I, 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 I think we can safely say that that's the way God often does things. Uh, sharing the good news about Jesus Christ has huge benefits for pre-Christians yes. as well as for Christians. That's right. That's right. I'll never forget when I was a young teenager and had the opportunity to share faith with a friend and he committed his life to Christ, and it changed my life completely, entirely. Of course, we don't know what Peter will do at this point. Uh, there was another prophet there in Joppa who was sent on a mission by God um, and totally disobeyed, skipped town, went the opposite direction. His name was Jonah. And Peter could have done the very same thing. You know, Jonah was racially and religiously prejudiced against the Ninevites to whom he was sent. And Peter was taught all of his life to be racially and religiously prejudiced against these pagan Romans. Why is this story included in the scripture? Actually, it's told three different times. This is about a pagan Roman who swore an oath of allegiance to a dictator who claimed to be God and sent him to occupy the Jewish promised land. He probably was living with a woman that he didn't marry. That's my guess. He, he had children by her. And, and he's commended for his prayers and his good works. And when the Bible is clear that good works will never get us to God. Let me tell you what I think is going on here. God was doing something new and wonderful that Christianity, and this is about you now, my friends, you and me, Christianity, now wasn't just about Jews. And everybody said amen. amen. The gospel wasn't only for perfect religious people. Thank God, thank God, thank God that Jesus died on the cross for everybody, the church is for everybody, and Jesus even will send visions to improbable people. 
He goes after pagans and seekers and, and people who have issues. And, and he wants even you, my friend, to completely, entirely surrender to him. And the question I need to ask is, has Jesus been pursuing you? Perhaps for a long time. It took a year for Dr. David. I can tell you other stories that will blow your mind. And the, the length of time. Three years for uh, uh, an atheist Jew in my congregation. Three years. One day at lunch, he said, If I, Pastor Galen, if I choose to never become a Christian, can I still come to your church? Oh. And that following Christmas, he called at 10 in the morning and said, I want you to be the first to know that I committed my life to Jesus at the Thanks. Christmas Eve service. I, mm -hmm. You know, God. I, let me just let me just finish this, okay? I want to pick it up at verse nine here. So let me just review for a little bit, and, and I, I promise you, Pastor Andrew, I'm almost done here. Cornelius, again, just a review, was attached to this Roman Italian regiment stationed at the seaport city of Caesarea, a pagan who was searching for God in the Jewish religion. He was a good man. He prayed, he prayed to the God of the Bible. He gave generously. I think it's important you understand this about this man. God sends this angel uh, a vision to point Cornelius to Simon Peter, who could tell him about Jesus. Peter was 32 miles south of Joppa. Cornelius followed the directions on the surface. The whole plan seemed rather unlikely. Jews were Jews, Gentiles were Gentiles, and, and usually the little, uh, they, the, they had little to do with each other, but God is this divine matchmaker, this hound of heaven. And, and, and it's, you know, this isn't the way that God always does it, but God always does it. He always does it. He always does it. So the angel talks to Cornelius at 3 p.m., okay? 21 hours later, Peter's stomach is grumbling, and he is ready to sit down to a really good kosher lunch at noon. And here's what happened. I want to start reading at verse 9, and then we'll finish it up. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry, wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened, something like a large sheep being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Verse 14, surely not, Lord, Peter replied, I've never eaten anything impure. Or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheep was taken back to heaven. Now remember, again, I can't emphasize it enough. Peter is this Orthodox Jew, a kosher diet every day of his life. What he ate, what he didn't eat, was at the core of his culture. Uh, and the expression of his faith, Jews were God's people. They were to be holy. Holy means different and, and included their diet. They didn't eat what everyone else ate. And Orthodox Jews were committed to the obedience of the Bible as God's word in the Old Testament clearly forbade what Peter was served on that tablecloth vision. If you read Leviticus chapter 11, it'll blow your mind. The animals that they were not allowed to eat. And truth be told, we don't know what most of those animals are. But they were forbidden. But Peter knew what they were. And all of his life he'd been taught that he was a Jew and Jews were different from everyone else. And that diet was one of the ways to be Jewish and to be faithful to God. Again, we're not, we're not sure why the Old Testament law declared some meat acceptable, other meats Unacceptable. Here's the point. And this you could also wax eloquent on, Pastor Andrew. The point, the big point, the big point was that this is what God said. And 
A faithful person does what God says, with or without a full explanation. Right. And Peter, he must have awakened the next year. He must have awakened ready to vomit his guts out. He <laughs> emphatically said, surely not, Lord. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. And I mean, even the supernatural vision, Peter had, he, he had to think about this. Look at verse 17. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking for Simon, who was known as Peter. Uh, was they, Let me start over. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. Verse 19, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up, go downstairs, do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. I'm wondering, I'm wondering what Peter was wondering, what he was thinking. It's not difficult to guess. I can't do this. What will my friends say? What will my mother think? And, and I think I'm going to get sick. Isn't this disobedience to the law of God? Isn't this a step down a slip, slippery slope that will lead to disobeying other laws of God like adultery and adult, uh, idolatry and adultery and lying and stealing and all of the other commands of God. Today it's a bite of pork. Tomorrow it might be sacrificing a pig in a pagan temple. And I, and I, I don't think it's hard to guess what Peter was thinking because, friends, devout, orthodox, conservative, Believers often struggle with the very same questions. And yet for Peter, the ultimate question was what God wanted and not what he thought. God, you see, was going to do a new and different thing. He was going to reach out with the gospel of Jesus Christ to people who are different. And it wasn't going to be easy for people or for Peter, nor is it easy for us. But if Jesus was willing to come from heaven, to this earth, then Peter had to step out of his comfort zone to reach others with salvation. And so with his stomach in a knot, he reluctantly went down the steps to answer the knock at the gate. Gentile pagans had come to learn about Jesus. They knew that Jews like Peter didn't like him. And so they they knew they weren't allowed in a Jewish home, and so they were careful to stay outside the gate in order not to offend. If you read through the end of, uh, well, through verse 23, it was one of the hardest things that Peter had done in his entire life. But he swung open the gate and invited these uncircumcised, pork-eating, pagan <laughs> Gentiles into his house. And it was in that very moment he thrilled the heart of God. Peter invited them in. They stayed overnight. They ate the evening and morning meals together. And the walls, listen friends, listen, listen, the walls of prejudice and race and religion, we're talking about medicine, began to tumble. And the gospel of Jesus Christ crossed the divide out of Judaism and into the whole wide world. And the church of Jesus Christ was going to be, was going beyond one region, one group, one tradition to become the faith to eternally transform people of every tribe, every nation, and every language. And this same Jesus, friends, yearns for our generation to be saved from sin and to come into eternal life. Our cultural issues, let's just say it, may not be about the meat that we eat, but we have barriers. We do, just like Peter, barriers of generation, barriers of race, the types of music, styles of clothing, worship style, political parties, ew, you know, and, so much more. They are important to us, really, just as Peter's kosher traditions were to him. But I'm telling you, 
Reaching people for Jesus is so far more important. Are we willing to go those places and meet people and hand out chocolate to kids in the neighborhood and eat food and hang out beyond our preferences and outside our comfort zones because I think so much of what stops us are just our feelings of inadequacy. But to do it for Jesus and for those whom Jesus loves and saves. There was a, an episode of Survivor Outback a few years ago where the contestants were given survival food from the Outback of Australia, I believe. And, and the foods were placed on this big uh, lazy susan and, and it included a nut, a dried scorpion-like uh, insect, a uh, live larva the size of my thumb, um, and a long wiggly worm, if I, understand, if I remember correctly. And, and the first contestant got the nut and immediately ate it, and the second got the larva and declined because she said, I'm a vegetarian. And, and the third got the long live worm and swallowed it and then vomited it back out. And so you wonder, you know, these people nuts, you know, why would anyone eat that stuff? And then you remember it is to win a million bucks and to be world famous. It's kind of a silly illustration, but I wonder what I would do. Not so much for money or fame, but for Jesus and for those who do not know him. I say that I would go anywhere and do anything and eat whatever and pass out chocolate and invite my neighbors and give all that I have, comfortable or not, risky or not, scary or not. I'd like to think that I would. I'd like to think that I would. But then I say to myself and to you, what if? What if we would all pray and we would all give and we would all learn to share and to go and to do whatever it takes for Jesus? And the missions director, this is a missions message right here. It is a missions message. If you want to move, friend, why don't we bow our hearts together? Would you do this? And then I'm going to turn it back to Pastor Andrew. Would you bow with me, please? I don't know. Perhaps there is one here this morning who is a pre-Christian. And in your heart of hearts, you are thinking that you might want to move from pre-Christian to Christian. To swear your lifetime allegiance to Jesus. You may not understand what all that means, but the starting point is a simple prayer. And then discover through God's word and through your pastor and through a friend what it means to grow in that Christian walk. If you're here this morning and that's you, you you're, you're at that point where you want to move from pre-Christian to Christian. Or maybe you're here and you're thinking, you know, I've been there, done that, and if it really, I want to encourage you to go again. Just go again. It's, it's, your, it's just, it's the best. It's the best life. And if that's you, then I want, to, I want to invite you to pray a simple prayer with me this morning. And if you pray these words directly to God, as weird as this sounds, I can promise you this morning eternal life because that's the promise of God's word. That is the promise of God's word. If in sincerity you pray this very simple prayer. So with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, perhaps each and every one of us would pray this simple prayer. God, thank you for pursuing even me. I, I want to become a Christian today, right now. I admit that I'm a sinner, and I'm sorry. And I know now that Jesus is the way to eternal life. I, I don't understand everything there is to understand about what I'm doing right now, but I know that Jesus is the way, and so I'm going to declare my trust, total trust, to him right now, and vow my full allegiance to Jesus Christ today and forever.
Jesus, you be the boss, the CEO. You call the shots because I know that that's where my life is the fullest. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Pastor Andrew, as Andrew comes, let me just, let me just say this. If you prayed that prayer, I want to suggest two action steps this morning. First of all, write this date down someplace. If you have a Bible, put it in your Bible. And secondly, just tell somebody. Tell a friend, tell one of the pastors, a family member, one of the leaders of the church here, and then you start the best journey that your life has ever had. God bless you, Andrew.